what science can't really take on board, I don't think, is the kind of human subject that we find articulated, for example, in something like psychoanalysis, which would be the subject of the unconscious, the subject of, the de of desire and of the death drive. As a kind of provocation, I guess I'd like to intervene here and focus on a couple of what I see as the prejudices of science, uh, which aren't necessarily to do with the prejudices of any particular scientist or any particular group of scientists, but what I would see as the kind of blind spots of science itself. So to go back to that idea of, of, of truth that was just mentioned, I think it's important that we make an initial distinction between truth and knowledge. And I would say that what science produces in the main is knowledge in the form of scientific facts, scientific theories. But I would say that truth itself is of a kind of a, a different order, at least philosophically understood as I would understand it. So if we take, for example, a big contemporary issue like climate change, for example, we know for a fact that science can furnish us with lots and lots of hugely kind of interesting information around CO2 emissions, the acidification of the, the soil, um, you know, make all these wonderful and fabulous kind of predictions about future weather events. But I would say that this is not the same as encountering the truth of our ecological and climate emergency. I would say that what an encounter with, with truth in this context really entails is something like a realization that the economic and political situation under which we live has to kind of radically change if we are to stand any chance of kind of maintaining a livable world. And so this is, as I would see it, an encounter with a kind of political and philosophical truth that obviously starts out with knowledge, but then exceeds knowledge in some way and results in a kind of a change in the subject's whole encounter with the world. So here I'm drawing on a, a philosopher, a French philosopher called Alain Badiou, that sees you know, this very clear separation between truth and knowledge and truth being a kind of encounter. The second point very quickly uh, that I want to make in terms of the blind spots or the, the prejudices of science is how science deals or fails to deal with the human subject. And I would say to the extent that science deals at all with the human subject, it is as a kind of rational, um, rationalizing being little more than a kind of complex processing machine in a way. So what science can't really take on board, I don't think, is the kind of human subject that we find articulated, for example, in something like psychoanalysis, which would be the subject of the unconscious, the subject of, the de uh, of desire and of the death drive. And I think by failing to account for that very kind of complex notion of human subjectivity, science itself, we might argue, and here I'm being provocative, starts out with a kind of faulty picture of the world. Very good, thank you, Ben. So, of course, a key uh, reason why we are discussing this issue about whether the personal, uh, whether science is affected by the personal view is because it's often perceived that science is somehow neutral, that it's just discovering what's going on. So the first theme I'd like to address here is, do we think that um, scientific truth is perspectival? Is it dependent on our world view? You know, can we get at, get, get at the evidence for stuff independently of the outlook uh, we bring to it? Maybe, Tim, what, 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 do you, what do you think about that? Well, I don't know, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult question, but you know, if I was to leave complicated issues like climate change and consciousness to one side for the time being, but we can come back to it, and just think about something in pure physics, and I mentioned Einstein's theory of relativity, I mean, that displaced the previous Newtonian paradigm. Einstein's theory was able to explain, you know, 
the fact that actually it takes a finite time for the gravitational effect of some collapsing star millions of miles away to affect us here on Earth, whereas Newton's theory said it would have happened instantaneously. And it seems, you know, and that's led to the picture of space-time being curved, which has been verified, you know, innumerable times now from the, from the telescopes looking at distant galaxies. So I think in some sense we could say our, you know, the truth about the nature of, uh, of, the, of the universe um, has improved as a result of Einstein's theory. And that's, I think, something that for me is a reasonably objective statement. We don't necessarily ever reach absolute, you know, final, ultimate truth. But I think we have a way in science of saying one theory is more true than another theory. Um, so I'm, I'm reluctant to sort of throw out the, the notion of truth altogether. As I say, the theory was arrived at by physical, personal hunches of Einstein, but has now been formulated in a way where it can be seen, and indeed it is taught, and I actually think this is one of the problems in education these days, it's taught in a very objective way. People rarely mention, you know, all the wrong paths that Einstein took in getting to his final equations, and we're taught the equations as if it's sort of self-evident, which it isn't. Can so, just, yeah. yeah. Um, first of all, the word taught. Um, so when we teach, I think we're, we're teaching what we have, we're passing on knowledge. Um, but then also this idea of, um, when you were describing, you know, that scientists just do the data collection, essentially, that's okay because, you know, some scientists go into science assuming that or uh, fully understanding that that is all they will do. Um, just to give an example, um, because I, I, I make uh, sort of science and technology films, short films, and I was filming with NASA where we were mapping, they take an old P3 bomber plane, they strip out all the, the old technology and they fill it full of cutting edge technology. And the purpose of the, the flight is to um, zigzag across the ice sheet that sits on top of Greenland. And they do the exact same zigzag year upon year to um, track how the ice sheet is shrinking. Um, and I, I asked the scientist on board who spend like eight hours a day on this aircraft, um, what they how they feel about the data and how they feel about the fact that this ice sheet is shrinking. And they said they are not going to comment on that because their job is to purely collect the data. And the job of collecting the data is really sophisticated. They've got LIDARs and like all these amazing bits of technology and they're focusing all of their, their energy um, on, on collecting that data. It then gets packaged and sent off to people that will interpret it. The thing is, it just so happened that year, I think we had the hottest year on record, and there was a, a front page of a tabloid magazine, um, newspaper saying, scientists got it wrong. And it's like, we, scientists get the blame for the interpretation of the data, when actually a lot of scientists go into science to just collect the data. So, you know, we've all got different reasons for going into science, um, and so, I think really collaboration is what's missing because one person does one thing, another does an, another. And we, we, we pool all, all of that information together and how it's interpreted is not down to the scientists. So I, I'm working on a, a, a new book at the moment and the starting point for that new book is an exchange of letters that takes place between Freud and Einstein in the 1930s. And the, the, the title of that collection is Why War? And it's this wonderful exchange between a scientist and a psychoanalyst on, you know, the, the motivations for war. Is it possible to imagine a, a society in which we, we, we've got beyond war? Um, and it's, you know, it's wonderful to have those, those, the, those different perspectives being exchanged. And I think that's something that, as you, as you rightly say, is maybe missing now from the, you know, the intellectual kind of scene as, it, as, as, as people become more and more kind of entrenched in their specific areas of, of, of research and intellectual activity. So perhaps, but perhaps if there was more discourse, we might be able to reach that ideal yeah. where we can go beyond war. Because it's, but it's more than just discourse. It's, it's, you know, how our governmental institutes organize 
uh, because ultimately, you know, it's about the career. People are worried about their careers. You mm -hmm. know, they don't want to go into some mishy-mashy, airy-fairy, interdisciplinary stuff if it's never going to give them a job. You know, this is the danger. So uh, we need it to be backed up by more than just sort of discourse. It's got to be backed up by, by government policy, effectively, in, in trying to encourage this type of um, cross, cross fertilization. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.